views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello everyone, welcome to OpenBXRX Remote, our special coverage from my newly renamed living workspace, Chari Executive Suites. So we're going to provide the latest on the impact COVID-19 is having in every aspect of our lives. And uh, as you know, I'm Brenda Valentin, and your host, the Café Con Leche, with you every Friday. And here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll speak to New York City Council member and Small Business Committee Chair Mark Jonai about the survival of New York City small businesses. And then after that, we, uh, we get a first look at New York City's schools remote learning at home when we speak to history teacher Colin Thompson from Emblaze Academy Charter School. Then we'll hear how City Meals on Wheels is working overtime to keep local seniors from going hungry amidst the outbreak. And later on in the show, Bobby C brings us an up to date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, this week's Open Artist Spotlight features our naming American pianist, Karine Pogosian, who will perform a special piece at the end of the show. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way, because now we are officially open. everyone, welcome to Open Remote. I'm Rina Valentin, your host Cafe Con Leche. For the next hour, always uh, actually encouraging you to get social with us online, uh, especially during these times. So you can follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV, as well as Twitter, and like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Our, our videos are being posted there. And if you're interested in speaking to me directly, um, you can find me on all those platforms. You can find me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Insta Stories, and LinkedIn at Rina Valentin. So, our um, the coronavirus it uh, it continues to impact our lives on, on so many levels, and uh, now small business owners they must they have to figure out a way to survive this crisis. And recently, Governor Cuomo ordered all non-essential businesses to shut down as the number of COVID-19 cases continues to rise in New York City. Our first guest has started a petition to ensure a small business relief policy is implemented during this pandemic. Here now to tell us more, we welcome council member of the 13th District and Chair of City Council Small Business Committee, Mark Jonai. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, Rena. You know, we're hanging in there under these uh, uncertain and chaotic times. Uh, first of all, let me just say that my thoughts and prayers are with all that are experiencing these unprecedented moments. Uh, just imagine a few weeks ago, uh, we were at a different place. And in the last couple of weeks, our lives have been turned over. Uh, it's just, um, it, it's hard to explain what has happened over two weeks time and how everything that we understood and relied on is no longer understood or reliable. Yes. And um, that quite frankly is somewhat of an understatement <laughs> because um, it's just, we're all dealing with a shock factor. And, um, and this week, uh, most recently, uh, the, they implemented all small businesses to shut down. Um, and quite frankly speaking, as a small business owner, uh, there is a struggle with small businesses to begin with uh, prior to this. So uh, how is this even going to resolve itself? Look, we know that our small businesses were struggling before um, the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Uh, now it's not even about struggling. It's a question of survival and what we can do to make sure these businesses survive. We know that a number of these businesses that were mandated to close down will never open again. We need to be as supportive as possible to ensure every small business is going to have that opportunity 
when this crisis is over, to reopen those doors. You know, we've destroyed, we've seen literally the American dream be destroyed. We understanding that the health factor uh, is the priority first. But when you work your whole life to put a small business together and you invest your, your sweat and your blood and your tears into something and to have it literally be destroyed before your very eyes, it's very emotional. Uh, to so be your department of the City Council Small Business Committee, um, you're the chair, like what exactly are you going to be able to offer to these small businesses to try and salvage their, their businesses? Well, right now it's about all levels of government coming together, whether it be city, state, and federal, and putting cash into the hands of small businesses so they can weather out this storm. Income tax, real estate taxes, water and sewer, uh, payroll taxes, what, uh, all of those charges should be set aside for the very moment, easing the concerns of these businesses as they try to figure out and reestablish their businesses and the very models that they have in place. In addition, the government should be also negotiating with utility companies, with banks to delay payments of loans and mortgages, um, and insurance companies to make sure for those that have had business interruption claims that they honor those claims. And obviously working with our property owners to make sure they're flexible with their tenants regarding rent payments. So That's at a bare minimum. That would keep cash in the hands of our small business. But more importantly, because we know that our businesses don't have cash reserves, we need to get immediate grants into the hands of these small businesses. Giving them loans with low interest uh, is, one, is not a solution. That's just going to put them further into debt. We need grants with immediate relief for our most vulnerable businesses, the small business, the micro business, the mom and pop shop. And then we can talk about loans to help them rebuild themselves. What are some of the other resources that people can turn to to just figure out means of surviving in this era? So the Small Business Services is offering not only the retention grant program, it's also offering the ability to borrow up to $75,000 for any company that has less than 100 employees. The real money is going to come in from the Small Business Administration, the SBA. Uh, we're anxiously awaiting to see what the uh, uh, package is going to look like. We know it's $2 trillion. I've been told that it's going to have everything that we possibly could want to help small businesses, including um, not relying on credit ratings um, and no personal guarantees. So that's just a few of the things that have been brought to my attention, but it's gonna take us a, a day or so to go through the actual package uh, that's being presented and hopefully be passed by uh, Congress today, I believe at one o'clock, and then we'll know more. Uh, we'll be offering um, a town hall web town hall for our small businesses early next week. We hope by Tuesday uh, we'll have something in place where we'll have uh, the small business administrator on the phone with us to answer any questions and talk more about the programs. So the message now is to our small business owners, just stay afloat. We're going to have grants and we're going to have loans that are going to be readily available to you. Uh, but the message should be clear to City Hall uh, and to Albany that we need our small businesses. They are what makes New York such a great place. And without them, we would be in dire straits. So before we go, let's talk about this petition that you've mobilized to ensure a small business relief po policy. So we start a petition uh, online. We have over 17,000 that have already signed on. Uh, it's at change.org. Uh, search Save Small Business Before It's Too Late. I encourage everyone to sign on and circulate that petition through social media with all their contacts. We need to deliver a message, and that message is wake up City Hall, wake up Albany. Our small businesses need help today. They need more in the form of grants and information than just 
rhetoric about loans down in the future. Uh, their, their world has been turned upside down. They've worked so hard to build these businesses. They've invested everything into them. And now to be shut down with uncertainty as to when they can reopen, if they could ever reopen, um, is truly emotional and devastating. I wanted to add something that I, 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 I should have mentioned earlier. Okay. You know, we have a lot of hardship out there. Many of our seniors and sick are homebound and don't have the financial resources or wherewithal to be able to shop or have food delivered to them. So for the members... Uh, the elderly and the sick and the homebound in the 13th council district. Uh, I've partnered up with our local restaurants and merchants that through their generosity and philanthropy are willing to feed and assure that our most vulnerable in their most time of need will have the basic of food and ability to eat um, for themselves. So I, I'm proud of the small businesses during these struggling times that still step up to the plate and offering whatever products they have to the most needy. That's beautiful. So is that being delivered? Yes. So we're, we're working out the um, intricacies now. Uh, some of our seniors, uh, and, we've, and we've broken down the district by neighborhood. So if you live in Pelham Parkway, we're partnering up with restaurants and merchants in that area. If you're on Morris Park or City Island or Throgs Neck or Allison Avenue or Westchester Square or Pelham Bay, we have local restaurants and merchants that are going to be there to support our elderly and sick, and keeping so, them at home and making sure it. that they yes. have the necessities to survive. Oh, that's it's so wonderful. It's really, that's the ref, the only refreshing aspect of this whole experience is just seeing everybody come together. And thank you for sharing that on your district. Now, can people find that on your website? Yes, I tweeted it. I put it out on social media. They have to contact my office. And obviously, you know, the supply is limited. So we encourage only those that truly need this service uh, to request it. And we don't know, again, the duration this can go on for weeks. It can go on for months. So our small businesses are willing to make that sacrifice. We just want to make sure that this service gets into the hands of those that truly need it as a necessity. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, and like you said, we're all in this together. So Thank you for making sure that your district is, is taken care of, uh, Marina. Marina, thank you for what you're doing and bringing out the awareness and uh, the information that's needed. Uh, without media, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you for the job that you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. And stay safe, blessed, and healthy. You too. Thanks. To help with the elderly and to save small businesses, please visit Council member Mark Jonai's Twitter account at Mark Jonai NY. And for any information regarding District 13, please visit council.nyc.gov. All right, so we have to take a quick break, but when we return, we're going to get some remote learning tips for students and parents alike. The first drive through coronavirus testing site in the Bronx opened on Monday at the Lehman College parking lot. The site is open Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and is accessible by appointments only. While we weren't able to approach the tents, we spoke to Dr. Denise Nunez of Montefiore Hospital outside of the site to find out more about the process. If they are um, qualified, they go through a big tent and then they are in the tents, they'll get uh, studied, which is like a three minute. It's really very quick and then they go home. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites like this one here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline at 888-364-3065. They would register, give us their first name, last name, um, their address and phone number. Um, we'll call them, we'll speak to them, ask them if they have some symptoms, what's going on, and then we'll give them a time and a date they can come in and come through their car, through the test site. They just have to make sure they keep distance from one to each other, that they wash their hands, um, that they don't touch their face. I, that's the most important thing. Um, just be careful. Sometimes we don't get sick, but then our family members can get sick. 
So we just have to make sure that people are, are just taking those precautions. And it's really simple. Like, we do that every day. Again, the number to call and make an appointment before visiting this drive through testing site is 888-364-3065. After taking the test, results take two to five days. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. It's a media network for you. BronxNet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on BronxNet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at BronxNet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> Hey everyone, and welcome back to our remote version of Open. Uh, this week, you know, students had to adjust to a new normal, voila, that uh, involved remote learning and parents, uh, such as myself, had to take on a new role of being a teacher. And well, this temporary way of life can be stressful for both the parent and the student. And our next guest is going to share more about this new system uh, while also giving us some teaching and learning tips during our mandated quarantine. quarantine excuse me. Please welcome in Blaze Academy history teacher Colin Thompson. Hello, Colin. Hi, thank you for having me this morning. Oh, welcome. And are you on a break from your remote learning to do this? I am interview? on a break. I am on a break. We are actually in the middle of structuring what remote learning will look like for the next several weeks. Um, when Mayor de Blasio uh, ended schools until April 20th, it caught some of us by surprise uh, because the Department of Schools uh, and the, the Department of Education had said that schools would remain open and it was essential for schools to remain open. So uh, Sunday, a week ago, when Mayor de Blasio closed the school system, uh, it sent us all into action, into action to, to determine what remote learning would look like. Um, our students are working on uh, projects and take home materials right now, but it will be about another week before our school fully launches uh, live online classes through Zoom and Google Hangout. All right. So uh, what we've been experiencing, um, I, I'm, I'm a middle school mom, <laughs> is this uh, Google Hangout or, or a Google Sheet that is... Uh, has the teachers pre-recorded with certain lessons and then there's a communication that's occurring through text and so uh, just out of curiosity i mean how were you all able to learn all of this in that amount of time absolutely so you know each school's remote learning program will look a bit different. I think uh, public schools and PS schools will have kind of the same model, but we are a standalone charter school. So we have some autonomy about what remote learning looks like for us. And, you know, our team just sprang into action. We came together like we always do to decide, you know, what would be the best plan of attack going forward for remote learning. Um, our classes will not be pre-recorded. We are going to have live courses where students log in every day. We have been very intentional about creating a schedule that meets the needs of students still provides the best education possible through this, as you said, new normal uh, way of learning. And our students will actually join uh, their math classes, their science, their history classes um, with the other students in the class live, have uh, live interaction with our teachers at Emblaze Academy through this digital platform, and then we'll complete assignments after the class is over. So how are you teaching right now at this present moment? At this present moment, we are utilizing Google Classroom to upload assignments. Uh, so they are not getting live instruction. That will start the week of April 6th. Uh, right now, students are downloading their assignments with instructions from teachers. A lot of it's continuing uh, the course material that we started before the closure happened and kind of reinforcing those skills. No new material is being presented at this time, uh, but that will come out. Um, uh, we'll start presenting new material the week of April 6th when we go fully live. So are you requiring that they arrive at a certain time? Is there a certain login that identifies the time they're logging in so that you're able to see that they're showing up on time? Are, are those kind of records being kept as well? Absolutely, because we still have to take attendance, right? And students are required to receive so many hours of instruction per year uh, from the State Department of Education. And so uh, students must log in at a certain time. Teachers are taking attendance. 
and we're keeping records of that for, you know, attendance records for, for the State Department of Education. Um, you know, and we have, uh, again, been very intentional about a schedule. Each student has received a schedule. They know, okay, it's 1040 a.m. on Monday. I'm logging into my math class. Uh, you know, via this link on Zoom. It's now 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Oop, it's time for science. So it's a, a schedule that mirrors their daily schedule at school, um, pretty much so. And they're just now having those classes virtually instead of in a physical space. Right. And so while you're also a middle school teacher, I'm a middle school mom, but I, I worry uh, about the parents who have younger younger children because um, my daughter's able to operate independently somewhat. You know, she's, she's basically responsible for signing in on her own and, and managing all of her classes and photographing her work and submitting it. And she's been doing a really fantastic job. But for those who don't have middle schoolers, I, I mean, it has to be a, a tremendous take on. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, the hold on the Department of Education closing schools down in the middle of this epidemic was to that point exactly, right? It's forcing parents to become teachers in the moment and helping students who may not be as independent as our middle schoolers or high schoolers are. I think it's very important. And I know that our school and, and some colleagues I have at various schools uh, across the city, Success Academy, KIPP, Democracy Prep, um, all of those teachers are offering office hours virtually as well. And to my understanding, most schools are doing that. So students can, with the assistance of their parents, log into this virtual um, office hour with their teachers uh, to receive as much instruction as impossible. I think it's really important for parents who uh, maybe have younger children and are struggling to uh, give them that instruction that they reach out to their administrators at their local school and see what resources like that are available. And so before we go, uh, you mentioned that the daily calendar, it looks like uh, as if though you were in school. And so uh, while you're a history teacher, are you in the entire day schedule or are you only on for your classes? So I'm only on for my classes and, and Blaze Academy has tried to streamline this and simplify this as much as possible for families. And so we are focusing on one subject a day in most cases. So Monday, for example, is math day. They have their math classes, their problem solving and cumulative review classes, which are part of the math department. On Tuesday is ELA and literature with close reading, guided reading. I am having my history courses paired with writing on Thursdays, for example. So I'm really only on on Thursdays, giving these live instructions via Zoom and Google Hangout. Um, and the rest of the week, I'm supplementing with office hours and grading assignments, emailing students, a lot of my middle schoolers. And it's been really comical to see the emails that they send me at all hours of the day. Mr. Thompson, can you help me with this? And so uh, I, right now I'm hosting an, uh, morning office hours as well. So I am working every day, um, except history is only being provided, provided once a week right now in this schedule. So in closing, would you say you're still able to get a sense of whether your students are applying themselves versus slacking? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, our, I have some wonderful students and they really they want to be doing something. You know, I've had so many students who self assigned themselves assignments and sent me things that they've researched about World War One on their own without any prompting because they want that normalcy and that routine. And if I may say in closing as well that, you know, I think it's so important for parents to help establish that routine for students. Um, students want a routine, they want consistency, and they want structure. And I think that's incredibly important when we're talking about remote learning, that parents are trying to create a schedule that is as normal and consistent as possible without the interruptions of Xboxes and cell phones and, and other distractors, that they're really trying to stick to the schedule that the school has laid out for this remote learning program. Which would be 8.30 to 3. Yes, based on, uh, that, and again, that, that varies by school. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your words of wisdom. Hopefully they resonate with some parents. And uh, congratulations to you on becoming an IT specialist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate you giving the opportunity to share. Absolutely. And uh, once again, you guys, that was a history teacher, Colin Thompson of Emblaze Academy. And for more information on Emblaze Academy, you can visit emblazeacademy.org. All right, so we have to take a quick break, uh, but when we return, we're going to hear how one organization is helping the elderly amidst the coronavirus outbreak. Don't go anywhere.
Hey everyone, welcome back to Open Remote. City Meals on Wheels is the largest delivery organization in the country and uh, they're dedicated to providing nourishing meals for the elderly throughout the community. According to the CDC, the elderly are one of the most vulnerable populations we need to protect during this COVID-19 outbreak, along of course with those who have pre-existing conditions. Since there is now a quarantine in place, uh, many have been left without centers to visit and get food. Joining us now to speak about City Meals on Wheels efforts during this pandemic crisis, please welcome City Meals on Wheels Executive Director, Beth Shapiro. Hi, Beth. Hi, Rena. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's really, these are really trying times right now, and it's just been really fascinating acquainting uh, ourselves with uh, individuals via this virtual style of interviewing. And um, and I know that you have been out there doing massive work. And, um, you know, let's just start with uh, sharing with everyone the, uh, the actual City Meals on Wheels having uh, one of the biggest distribution uh, square feet centers in the Bronx. And uh, yeah, share with us the, the massive volume you've been dealing with in the past couple of weeks. Sure. So City Meals is always providing weekend, holiday, and emergency meals to homebound elderly New Yorkers. We're typically delivering to 18,000 people in all five boroughs, about 2 million meals a year. About 500,000 of those meals typically come from our emergency meal distribution center right in Hunts Point in the Bronx. To put some framework around what we're doing now, we have delivered 150,000 meals and are in the process of packing and preparing to deliver 300,000 more in the coming weeks, all emergency meals coming from the emergency meal distribution center. So in just a month or so in total, we have we will have done almost what we did all of last year in emergency meals. In a matter of how many weeks? <laughs> well, we started two weeks ago and I assume it will, you know, we'll be going for the next few weeks, obviously. Um, and as long as we need to, to get food to older New Yorkers who are in need right now. So how are, where's the food coming from? Sure. We, uh, all over, literally all over the country. From the warehouse, um, we're doing shelf-stable meals. So it's food that people can have on hand. There are still uh, meal deliveries going out with fresh meals from meal centers around the city. They're purchasing, procuring, buying, trying to cook. And as long as that happens, um, those will be several meals a week. And then these shelf-stable meals to fill in the, the whole, you know, making sure there's food every day of the week for these people. So how is this distribution occurring? Is it a daily distribution, a weekly distribution? How is that occurring? It's typically daily. We've moved to less frequently, but more meals at a time because our roles are increasing. We, as I had said, we feed 18,000 people normally, but they're now an additional 22,000 older New Yorkers who usually get their lunches, sometimes breakfast and lunch at a senior center throughout the city. Those people don't have that option anymore. So we're adding them to getting emergency meals as well. We have volunteers and staff deliverers all over the city. There's a dire need for volunteers. Um, it, last week in total for, for the last week or two, we had over 400. We'll probably have another 250 volunteers just this week alone, helping us get food where it's needed. So what kind of volunteering are you referencing? Are you looking for people to help pack? Are you looking for people to deliver? Are you looking for people to just uh, be in communication with some of these people? Because I also understand that you offer the service of, of just checking in on these elders. And, and I know that right now during these times, the, these methods are being done either by phone and or through the door which has been really interesting just to the whole concept of it is just, wow. It is. It's a complete, um, you know, switch for us, right? We're always dealing with people who are isolated. I think the general public has a much stronger understanding of what that means now. And we can't walk in to someone's home to deliver a meal. So we're following CDC guidelines, you know, deliverers are wearing gloves. 
and talking through the door to make sure someone's there. We're not going to leave meals just hanging on a door. Um, so making sure someone's there and doing a distance handoff. We need volunteers for that. We need volunteers packing at the warehouse. And we do, as you said, deal with isolation on, on a, any given day. And we actually have a friendly visiting program where we pair a meal recipient with a volunteer and they agree to meet weekly for an hour or so. And typically those relationships last for years. Obviously, we had to end that. And a few weeks ago, we switched to changing that from person to person meetings to phone calls, just to still connect and communicate with, with people who are isolated and hungry. Right, and they're older. And so with uh, regards to this communication uh, component, are you looking for volunteers to make phone calls as well? We're not yet. We, we sort of have staff on hand for that, but we, you know, depending on how that long this lasts, we will be looking for volunteers to make phone calls. And right now, our greatest need is volunteers to deliver meals and to and pack up at our warehouse. We've doubled the staff up at the warehouse and have had 20 to 40 volunteers every day up there packing these shelf stable meals to get them out where they need to be. So how do people volunteer? Do they have to sign up somewhere or do they just show up? No, please don't show up. You can go to citymeals.org and there's a link to volunteer. Um, and that's the best way to do it or to email. I can give you someone's email right now. She may kill me, but I hope this gets great exposure and people, you know, it's Vivian, V-I-V-E-N-N-E um, at citymeals.org to volunteer and we'll, we'll put you to work. Okay. And so before we go, can you just share how an elderly who may not be yeah. listed within the senior citizens can get in touch with uh, the organization to have food delivered to them as well? Two ways. Of course, call 311, the city's hotline. But also, if you visit citymeals.org, there's a link for volunteering, there's a link for donating, and there's a link for Get Meals. So people can get information about getting meals, how to sign up, the phone numbers in their local area to call to make sure we get food where, where they need it. All right. Then thank you so much for your time, Beth. And, you know, thank you for being there for our elders. Are there any last words you want to share with our viewers? You know, I think it's a time where everyone is stressed and nervous. And if you can think about, of course, yourself and your own safety, but even your neighbor across the hall or, or down the, on a different floor in your building. And if it's someone you don't normally see, just knock on the door and make sure they're okay. And, you know, it's really about neighbors helping neighbors right now. Absolutely. In the end, we're all in this together. We are. We are. Thank you. Thank you. And you guys, for more information on City Meals on Wheels, you can visit citymeals.org. All right, don't go anywhere. Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next.
morning, sports fans. Bobby C. back out here at Yankee Stadium. Yesterday was supposed to be opening day around Major League Baseball. Yanks and Mets. Yanks were supposed to be in Baltimore to take on the Orioles at Camden Yards. But coronavirus had different plans. Here's a look at how this pandemic has affected the world of sports. In a coronavirus hit world, sports, like many other things we grew accustomed to, is essentially gone. Thursday, March 26, was supposed to be Garrett Cole's regular season debut in pinstripes. Our Bronx State cameras were all set for the prize right-hander to make his first trip to the hill in his new Yankee uniform. But Cole's first start will have to wait. Mets opening day will have to wait, too. Nearly two weeks ago, Utah Jazz center Rudy Gobert became the first sports face of the pandemic. He tested positive for COVID-19 which set off a chain of events unlike anything we've ever seen in the NBA, and sports for that matter. It's not his fault, of course, even if he becomes the most memorable name attached to all of this. Other notable players followed suit in the NBA. Stars Donovan Mitchell and Kevin Durant, among them, also tested positive in the days afterward. The Jazz OKC Thunder game was called off that night, and a short while later, the league suspended the season until further notice. The association's decision prompted other major collegiate and professional sports leagues to follow too. And at this stage, it is unclear when sports will resume in the U.S. It's unclear when life will normalize again. Tuesday, the global sports calendar took another hit. The decision to postpone the 2020 Tokyo Olympics by a year will further disrupt things. A calendar that has already been wrecked by the pandemic and one that will surely be marked for a packed year next year, assuming things return in time. Hard to have a sports roundup of what would have been March Madness without any college basketball hoopla. My heart breaks for the Florida men's basketball team, which won an 8-10 playoff game. Or the St. John squad that had its Big East matchup halted at halftime after winning in the opening round, too. The NCAA canceled March Madness. The men's and women's college basketball tourneys were just too risky. The cancellation extended to all remaining winter and spring NCAA championships as college sports near and far said goodbye to the spring seasons. All those seniors just looking for one more campaign. From D1 to D3, it was all gone. Just like that. In the midst of all the sadness, though, there was plenty of unification as players and teams stepped up for those in need. Kudos to Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban for getting this narrative going. In response to Nets guard Spencer Didwini tweeting about taking care of non-salaried arena workers, management responded by saying the franchise is putting a plan in place to help out Barclays Center staff. MSG reportedly plans to pay employees who work Knicks and Ranger games too and is working on a long-term plan for paying its staff as the sports world is at a standstill. MLB donated $1 million to emergency food services and each team pledged $1 million for ballpark workers affected by the shutdown. Baseball also announced support for minor leaguers who haven't been paid since August. The aid and the feel-good stories have helped a bit. It's so hard to fathom a world without usual contact, a world without major sporting events. Even at Churchill Downs, horse racing's jewel in the crown, the Kentucky Derby, is moving to September 5th, postponed by all of this. The late summer derby would mark the first time the race isn't held, the first Saturday in May since 1945, when it was postponed to June, during the waning months of World War II. In motorsport, the first eight races of the Formula One calendar postponed. Monaco won't happen in May. Races in the Netherlands, Spain, and the prestigious event in Monaco, Monaco, all have been postponed. Even star racer Lewis Hamilton is home, self-quarantined after coming in contact with actor Idris Elba, who tested positive for COVID-19. MotoGP is on hold with its latest race in Thailand postponed on March 22nd. The professional tennis tour, men's and women's, has been suspended until June 7th with all clay court tournaments in Europe canceled. ATP and WTA rankings have been frozen until further notice. 
In boxing, the third fight between heavyweight world champion Tyson Fury and former titleist Deontay Wilder is still on track to be their next bout, but it will not take place on July 18th as originally planned due to the coronavirus pandemic. The list goes on and on and on. The NHL, the National Hockey League, primarily based in the U.S., but with teams from Canada, also suspended its season. As we take a look at this picture of a new sports world, the Olympics really put things into perspective. Olympic competition has been canceled only three times in the 124-year history of the modern games, and all three instances were because of global conflict. 1916 World War I, 1940, and 1944 World War II. But never has the Games been pushed back a year, an enormous undertaking for a global event with more than 11,000 athletes from around the world. And it's not just the Games, of course. It's also the people from the sports world that won't recover. The coronavirus is hitting New York City hard, and on Monday it took the life of a one-time local basketball star. Former St. John's guard Lee Green passed away from the pandemic that is sweeping the country. A parade All-American in high school, the Bronx native played for St. John's from 1991 to 1994, reaching two NCAA attorneys. He remained a St. John's fan and attended its win over DePaul at the Garden on January 11th. Many leagues have gone by way of the internet, electing to run what they can virtually. Last Sunday, drivers from all three NASCAR National Series competed in a 100-lap iRacing event at the virtual Homestead Miami Speedway. The broadcast on Fox Sports 1 with Mike Joy, Jeff Gordon, and Larry McReynolds drew 903,000 viewers. Fox Sports has announced it will broadcast all remaining rounds of the eNASCAR iRacing Pro Invitational Series. IndyCar and F1 are running similar leagues. Challenging times like this have forced us to get creative. Like Slam, taking the NBA world into video games, but not for hoop, but rather Call of Duty. At 15 years old, Bronny James Jr., LeBron's son, is in the prime of his video game days. Slam held a Call of Duty Modern Warfare tourney and it live-streamed the games on Twitch over the weekend. A freshman at Sierra Canyon, Bronny played with and against NBA players in this 6 vs 6 tournament. Myers Leonard, Mario Hazonia, Zach Levine, and Donovan Mitchell were on his team. Bronny and his team lost the series 4-3, nearly coming back from a 3-0 deficit. We miss you, sports world. Hang tight while we heal. Practice social distancing and wash our hands. We'll be back, and we know that you'll be back too when the time is right.
everyone. Welcome back to Open Remote. Our last guest is an award-winning Armenian-American pianist who made her first solo debut at the Carnegie Hall at the age of 23. She's a regular in our studios and has graced many prestigious stages. And today she will be presenting virtually. Please welcome Karine Pogosian. Hi, Karine. Hi, Rina. Good to see you. It's good to see you too, honey. How are you holding up? Oh my goodness, it's definitely been a little crazy, but we're uh, doing the best we can. Uh, yes, and so um, <clears throat> one of the reasons I, I definitely wanted us to reach out to you is because as I introduced uh, you as an Armenian American, I know that your family is in Armenia and I uh, was just wondering how you're able to remain in contact and what it looks like over there during these it's times. I mean, it's uh, it's incredibly intense. Everyone is also quarantined uh, in uh, Armenia, and everyone's being very, very careful. So, yeah, a lot of uh, Facebook contact and uh, anxious messages, and very uh, sometimes very comical selfies and all of that, just to relieve the stress. But uh, thankfully, we're all holding up well, and it's I think it's just a matter of a lot of patience and. You know, just uh, lay low and be patient and um, it and will And keep pass. the faith and keep the faith. Indeed. <laughs> it will pass. Yes. So um, <clears throat> I noticed you're sitting there next to your partner. I am, my baby. I'm going to assume that you've been getting a lot of practicing in. Indeed. It's uh, it's getting pretty bent out of shape, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Day and night. <laughs> But now I'm, I'm very grateful to have my, my dear piano with me at home. Well, it, it's a beautiful thing, right? Uh, because you have a relationship with yeah. a, an instrument that you basically get to control. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, my uh, lifesaver. I mean, it's the most therapeutic thing in the world to go into the world of music. And it's, um, it's you know, beautiful vibrations, beautiful sound just uh, soothes your, your soul. So, so very grateful. So just walk me through a day in, in, in the life of Karine with her piano. Uh, well, uh, early in the morning, my favorite thing to do with my morning coffee is to do a bit of journaling. I'm an avid journal journaler and I just kind of write down some inspiring thoughts or uh, things I'm grateful for and goals of the day. And then I dig in, I practice a couple hours um, when I practice, I actually am one of those very boring, slow practicers. So I'm assuming my neighbors are bored to death because <laughs> I'm doing a lot of detail work. Uh, but then I also, towards the end of the day, I do a lot of kind of mini performance type of uh, practice where I just try things out in full tempo. Uh, and just, uh, so I guess they don't complain at that point, right? At that point, like, yeah. Oh, we have to go through the process, but ooh, yes, it was <laughs> worth it. Hopefully, hopefully they're they're not too annoyed. Yeah, uh, but it's um it's a very joyful uh, life. I'm I'm incredibly grateful to be an artist, a musician. And so you mentioned <laughs> these uh, concerts or these mini uh, videos that you're capturing, and you were sharing uh, with us that you've been doing this on a daily basis prior to this uh, unprecedented uh, uncertainty. And so let's talk a little bit about how you started this in January before we were even mandated to remain under quarantine. I have no idea if this is serendipity. I don't know what this, this is, but it's, it's quite uh, fascinating. But yeah, January 1st, I decided to challenge myself and do a 365-day project on uh, uh, Patreon. And uh, on uh, my page there, I would basically post the little mini performance of the day, whatever I practiced that day. I wanted to push myself and just kind of try it out and uh, share with uh, my supporters, my followers. And it's been a beautiful community, again, as you say, before all this madness, because people just come and say, you know, this is such a nice escape from my day to day. It's uh, uh, my favorite way to end the day or my favorite way to start the day, um, depending on when they watch. And it's just been beautiful. And now uh, this past week, it's become so meaningful. I mean, some of the comments people write, I just I was, you know, getting teary. I just uh, feeling such a, a, a level of responsibility that, you know, I'm doing something really um, important. I should I should keep at it. 
and it's definitely going to be worth something. I mean, you're worth everything as far as I'm concerned, because I personally enjoy uh, visiting you at Carnegie Hall. I love sitting in those fabulous seats you, you assigned to you. us. And My favorite two lost. front row seats. <laughs> <laughs> front and center, baby. Yes. With, with your little prodigy eventually, My hopefully. girl, yes. <laughs> Love you, yeah. <laughs> oh gosh, I lost you. Oh gosh, can you see me? Okay, yes, wait. I, I can't see you, but I see the little icon. Okay, here I am. How about now? Oh, there we go. Here I am. So, <laughs> um, anyway, all that to say that uh, the work that you're doing is so important, and the fact that you were already doing this as at the top of the new year and based on our current circumstances and, and the fact that you've committed to 365 days, this is going to be one interesting grand concert when it's completed. Right. Right. That's uh, I'll definitely look back uh, with uh, uh, astonishment and pride and I don't know, many different emotions when, when the year is done and, you know, every every single thing I've experienced throughout the year has been uh, documented with little glimpses every day. They, uh, I have some of the um, videos are actually from concerts, uh, so they get the kind of little behind the scene visual. So it's yeah, it's gonna be very special at the end of the year. Oh yes, it's it's almost as if though um, it's your own uh, style or a virtual autobiography, for lack of a better word, through your music. I suppose, and your experience. Yeah, 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 basically, yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm looking forward to it. And I understand that you're going to send us off with a, a melody. What will you be playing for us today? Well, I thought we all could use lots of positive, uh, vibrant, colorful uh, energy and some good vibes. So I thought I'd play a little bit of the beautiful Firebird by Igor Stravinsky. Uh, so I'll share with you guys a bit of the uh, finale, the last movement. Bravo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to just sitting back and having my cafe and ah. listen to the beautiful sounds of Karine Pogosian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> you always make me want to cry. Um, I had to write while you were playing. And while I know it's the end of the segment, I have to read this really quickly because <laughs> this just came out of me while you were playing. Um, uh, it's really quickly, is reality. As we raise our flag for humanity, the silent enemy does not seek by identity before physicality. So I say to us to thee let us remember we are one race and that is the human race oh my god you're making me cry now that is beautiful thank you thank you thank you Mwah. so grateful right now <laughs> oh, gosh oh my gosh i need to close out this segment and and, <laughs> and i'm struggling with it but i want to thank you for loaning your talents and and just being with us during these really difficult times, Karina, and thank you. It's been beautiful to see you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Please keep it up. Thank you. You guys, once again, for more on Karina Pogosian and to get a dose of her music on a daily basis, you can go to patreon.com. And on March 27th, uh, Friday at 8 p.m., she will also be presenting an FB Live virtual performance on her Facebook page at Karina Pogosian pianist so mi gente that is our show today thanks to all our guests for coming through and to you our viewers for tuning in if you missed any part of the show you can check out the recable cast tonight and 24 hours a day at frostnet.tv i'm rena valentine and from all of us here at open may the universe provide peace prosperity and love and uh well digitally linked in solidarity I want to remind you all that we are all in this together. So stay blessed, healthy, and safe. And most importantly, stay home. Stay home. Adios. <laughs> <laughs>